हेलो हेलो हाय या हाउ आर यू गुड गुड ओके ओके सो आई थिंक वी कैन बिगिन सो योर्स इज द लास्ट टॉक ऑफ फायर एंड विद दैट वी विल बी क्लोजिंग फायर 2022 एंड होपफुली विल बी रिटर्निंग बैक नेक्स्ट ईयर सो लेट मी गिव अ स्मॉल introduction and maybe then you can start with your uh, talk is okay. that fine yeah all right okay uh, yeah good evening everyone uh, so today we have uh, uh, professor cynthia rudin with us from duke university and she, she her research area focuses on interpretable uh, machine learning and she has received many awards in uh, new ips and triple ai and kdd which are top conferences in our field and uh, today her talk focuses on uh, understanding how uh, dimension detection tools work so i welcome professor cynthia rudin and yeah so you can begin the stage is yours awesome okay great yeah so my talk is on how um, understanding how dimension reduction methods work um so many of you have probably heard of tsne or tsne which is the most famous dimension reduction algorithm and um tsne uh, uh its input is high dimensional data and its output is low dimensional data and that low dimensional data is supposed to preserve something about the structure of the high dimensional data maybe the graph structure or local neighborhoods or you know um the global structure um it's not really clear exactly what it preserves <laughs> but it really is very helpful because it allows you to understand what high dimensional data actually look like um in high dimensions so like when you project it down you can it preserves the sort of structure of the data and you can actually see what's going on in that data and so it's actually really quite useful anyway um i was lucky enough to catch a talk by martin wattenberg a while back on how to use tsne effectively and he pointed out in his talk that the hyperparameters for tsne really matter like the the original data is just two gaussian blobs then all the algorithm has to do is leave them alone but um this but this algorithm like if you change the hyperparameters it doesn't it it messes them all up it produces like really stringy textures and like it doesn't necessarily represent the truth of what the data actually are i mean this is just you know ridiculous <clears throat> because you're not seeing the separation between the clusters at all. And also he pointed out that, you know, there's, there's a lot of other things you should ignore when you're looking at these um, dimension reduction plots. You can't really trust them. And I've since realized that results like this are problematic because biologists use these methods to figure out what's going in, on in biological data. Uh, and, you know, these problems are not supervised. You don't know what the data really look like in high dimensions so you might get misled into thinking the data is one thing when it's actually not and this is a problem for anyone using high dimensional data who wants to see what's in it and so i ended up leading a working group at samc um, and uh, these are my collaborators so so, so ying fan was an undergrad hai yang's phd student and yaron is my um, collaborator at the university of rochester and we spent a semester trying to understand the topic and here we are four years later still working on it <laughs> anyway, 
So uh, I'm going to start with an example. This is a 3D data set, and I'm going to project it to 2D. So it's like taking this mammoth and just pushing it onto the page like a leaf between two pieces of paper. And I'm going to try a lot of different dimension reduction techniques. So this is ts &E with different perplexity values. And again, <laughs> not, you know, it looks like it dismembered the mammoth and ran it over with a steamroller. Um, here's, here's a few more perplexity values like that. Um, it still doesn't look like a mammoth. It still looks like a chicken over here. This is UMAP, which is supposed to be an improvement over ts &E. Not too much of an improvement there. Uh, this is large viz. Again, supposed to be an improvement over these two. Not so much. It even separated the mammoth's legs off into their own separate clusters, which we know is not true. And then this is TriMap, which gave a reliable global structure here. Um, and then this is PacMap, which um, is the method that we derived um, from the reading group. So let's show you another example. So in this um, mammoth data set, the global structure was important, whereas for the MNIST data set, this is handwritten digits, um, for this data set, local structure is important. And so you can see that TSNE um, does what it usually does and fills up the space. UMAP did a beautiful job here, separating all the clusters. TriMap um, didn't do a good job because it, you know, if you didn't have the colors, you wouldn't know that these are all separate handwritten digits. And then PacMap did very similar to UMAP. All right, and also, oh, TSNE had a problem here because it separated some of the clusters. Like these clusters should be together and they're separate into different clusters, which is not good. That's a failure of global structure preservation. So what you're seeing in the last couple slides is that a lot of methods have trouble with this balance of preserving local versus global structure. Local structure is like the local neighborhood graph or nearest neighbors. You want to preserve that, like the high dimensional nearest neighbors should be the low dimensional nearest neighbors. Um, and then global structures, like where the clusters are laid out in the space, you know, relative distances between points, things like that. So if you think about the different methods, um, PCA is like the quintessential global preservation method. Doesn't do local structure pretty much at all. TSNE does pretty much only local structure and not global. UMAP, believe it or not, also is mostly local. Um, it gets its uh, it gets its global structure from PCA initialization, and then PacMap is actually does does both both local and global structure. All right, so just a little history of dimension reduction here. So it started out the field started out with global methods, right? Like PCA, uh, and then it, people got really interested in local methods starting around the year two thousand. And they de designed all of these methods that preserve distances and not neighborhoods. People thought you had to preserve high dimensional distances, but that didn't work um, because the distances tend to be all the same in high dimensions. And so people just abandoned kind of doing this. And then um, things changed around 2003 with SNE, but that one had a crowding problem. So a lot of the points would just plop on top of each other and you couldn't see what was going on. And then the latest generation are these mostly local methods that try to preserve the neighborhoods um, of the point. So who are your neighbors? And so uh, that's, that's kind of where they are. But these methods, the problem is that they don't work like they're supposed to, as you saw. And so you end up with this like literature. It's almost like a cottage industry of methods, of papers that tell you how to use these methods. Because like the whole reason these papers exist is because the methods don't work right. And it was hard to tune parameters and get the global structure. So when we were looking at this problem, we tried to figure out what these methods were doing. And so we looked at their you know, loss function. So all the methods have loss functions that they minimize. And we put them all on the same table and we looked at them and they just don't look even close to each other. Like it was almost like nothing was in common when you put them side by side. And so we just sort of gave up. We just said, oh, this, is not, this, is, this is not the right way to handle this, looking at these equations. So we decided that um, we would do some experimentation. And after a huge amount of that, we found that certain specific properties of the loss function are important for preserving local structure, whereas the choice of which graph components to exert forces on is important for global structure. OK, what does that mean? So all of those methods 
optimize objectives that look like this. And this is a sum over graph components. These are either pairs of points or triplets of points. So it's a sum over like triplets of points or something. And then there's a weight for each graph component and some loss for how well that was preserved when you projected it down. And what we found was that if you want to preserve local structure, the properties of this loss function are really important. Whereas if you want to preserve global structure, the choice of who ends up in this sum, what you're summing over, that actually controls global structure. So you can control them both if you want to. All right, and that's, that's what we did with PacMap. So um, I want to spend a little while first talking about local structure. So what, like, as I mentioned, there's not really anything clearly in common with all of these loss functions, right? Trying to find something in common with all of them is not fun. But we did find a way that all these functions are similar. And it doesn't involve equations, it involves a figure. And that figure is called the rainbow plot. So the rainbow plot is a way to visualize and understand the loss function for dimension reduction. So you take a triple, it's an i, j, k triple. i is me, j is my friend, k is my enemy. <laughs> so j is a point that's close to me in high dimensional space, and k is a point that's far from me in high dimensional space. So when I project down, this is my friend, it should be close to me, I should attract that, that point to me. And then k is um, supposed to be far away from me, so I should repulse k, right? So <clears throat> the rainbow plot, we plot, you know, for point i, we plot the distance to its neighbor j on this axis, the distance to the further point k on this axis. And where you want to be, right, where you want to be is here, right? This has low loss because here your neighbor is close to you and your enemy is far away. That's good. So low loss over here. The worst is when you're over here. So this is when your enemy is close to you and your friend is really far away. Okay, your neighbor in the high dimensional space is far away and the point that's supposed to be far away is actually close by. So this is the loss function's bad. Okay, so the question is, so those two are obvious, what happens to the rest of the plot? <laughs> so what about over here? So over here, your enemy and your friend are both, cl both close to you. So how comfortable do you feel? And the answer is you feel uncomfortable, <laughs> okay? If you're doing dimension reduction, you feel uncomfortable. Your enemy should always be far away. And then if you're over here where your friend and your enemy are both far away, that turns out to be not so bad. So um, just to fill in the, the blanks here. So um, if your enemy is close to you at all, you get upset. As long as your enemy is far enough away, you're really happy when your friends are close. Otherwise, yeah, blah, whatever, okay. <laughs> All right, so let me just fill in the whole thing. This is one of these uh, rainbow plots right here. This is just the magnitude of the gradient. And what you're seeing here um, is, you know, this is what the loss function looks like for, um, for um, and I don't even know which algorithm it is because frankly, three out, of, three out of four of them look the same. So if I show you the rainbow plots for all of the different, um, all of the different algorithms, they all look the same except for TriMap, which, as we already know, doesn't really preserve local structure very well. So that one is like a failure case right there. But the other three, the uh, rainbow plots look very similar. All right, so from seeing this, seeing that they all had very similar rainbow plots, we developed a set of principles for a good loss function. Um, I'm not, it, it's a set of theorems. I'm not gonna write all the, well, it's a set of like equations and it's all formalized and stuff. I'll just draw you the cartoon and I'll tell you that each of the things is sort of formalized with respect to differential equations. So for instance, um, you really want to go up and to the left because you want attraction this way, repulsion this way. So there's this monotonicity property. Um, also, except for the bottom here, the gradient should go mostly to the left. So you're having this broad attraction for your friends. At the bottom, there's a large gradient that goes up because you really want to repulse your, your enemies. And then there's a very small gradient on this side. Um, and you really, you really want that because you don't want to have overcrowding. Like if your friend is already really close to you, you don't want to pull them in further because you don't want to have a crowding problem where all of the points are on top of each other. So anyway, there are these formal principles for what a good loss function looks like. And in fact, all of these obey those properties, even, even this one. 
um, which is interesting because you know it, it doesn't it doesn't quite do um, local structure, but it's not that bad. So while we were doing this, um, we tried to construct some other loss functions. This is before we knew about the rainbow plots. We tried to come up with our own equations for loss functions, and they didn't work. Um, and um, I can show you why. And it's because the rainbow plots are really failures. Um, so here's how these algorithms performed, these loss functions performed on the MNIST data set. And um, yeah, we expected them to do well, but they didn't. <laughs> and so looking at the rainbow plots, you can see that none of them look right. You know, like remember on the bottom, it's supposed to be pushing away the enemy. Like this whole bottom part's supposed to be red, right? If you go back here, right? The whole bottom, that's supposed to be pushing away the enemy. So it's supposed to be all red and here um, it's not. Uh, so here, like you can see um, that also this doesn't, it's not monotonic. It's supposed to go mostly to the left. And then here there's no force on the bad guys. And then over here, um, it's going, it's increasing in this direction. It's not supposed to do that. It's supposed to be kind of pushing away bad guys over here as well. Um, here's another one where you, there's absolutely no repulsion on bad guys, and so that's why all the points are on top of each other. It's because there's a detraction force, but not a repulsion force. And then for this one, it's like almost good enough, but there's again not a good repulsion force on um, on points that are supposed to be far away, and so you just don't get the repulsion between classes that you should. So anyway, once we had a good understanding of what the rainbow plot was supposed to look like for a good loss function, we could design a much simpler loss function that um, actually that actually works and it has the same rainbow plot. So PacMax loss is just much simpler. So you define the distance as the Euclidean distance in the low dimensional space squared plus one. Um, the one is to avoid zero in a denominator. And then instead of all of this like complicated stuff over here, PacMap has three terms. <laughs> it has a repulsion force, which is this one, a um, attractive force, which is that one, and then one that I haven't told you about yet. And I can just write them down, and they're just really, really simple as compared to this mess, which I can't even comprehend at all. Like this is just a repulsive force. So here you want the distance to be small or uh, large to make this to make that thing small. And here you want the distance to be um, small to make this thing large. Okay, so that's that's all it is. Anyway, so that's uh, local structure. And then I need to tell you about global structure. So for global structure, I want to point out that UMAP just and TSNE, they just don't have enough forces. So if you plot the forces away from any point um, as a function of distance, you'll see that they just fade very, very quickly. So what you're seeing here is a strong repulsive force because if you know if if your enemy gets too close to you, you push it away really hard, and then that force disappears, and then the attractive force looks like this. So it just it just fades away very very quickly, and that's I think that's the problem. I think UMAP and TSNE I think they're just nearsighted. So anyway, um, my student Ying Fan who was an undergraduate undergraduate at the time, she said, I have an idea. Let's just attract, let's just do an attraction of points that are not that close to us, that are just a little further away. So she said, let's attract mid-near points to maintain global structure. So here's a point right here. And what she suggests is to attract points that are just, that are not that close. They're a little further away. So they're, they're mid-near points. So for PacMap's loss, what we did was, and by the way, these linear points, what the way that she defined it was that she would randomly choose six points and she, she would make the second one of the six, the mid near point that we would exert the attractive forces on. And that generally fixes global structure. Okay, so PacMap's loss function, I can put the whole thing up on the screen now. It has three terms. <laughs> so the attractive force over here for the neighbors, the repulsive force over here, and then this is for the mid near points. And the mid-year points, it's also an attractive force, just kind of like a very, very gentle attractive force that pulls those mid-year points closer to us. Now, the mid-year pairs really do have an effect, like just including this term and, you know, the sum over the mid-year pairs, it makes a huge difference. 
Um, oh yeah, I just told you about that already. All right, so if you put in zero mid-near pairs, you don't get any global structure. If you put in even two mid-near pairs, you can maintain almost full global structure with those two mid-near pairs for each, for each point. So it's really quite remarkable how, how important it is to just add some kind of global structure, gentle attractive forces. Anyway, so, um, and here you can see um, kind of, this is pack map over iteration. So it starts um, with random, you know, a random projection. And then in the first stage of it, it fixes its global structure using the mid-near points. And then in the second stage, it kind of eases off global structure preservation and tries to, um, tries to sort of start fixing local structure. And then in the third stage, it's all local. Everything's local. It, start, it just maintains local structure by, by removing the weights on the mid-near pairs and just kind of making sure that the local structure is fine. All right, cool. So now I've explained to you what makes DR algorithms tick. So we designed PacMap, and then we ran into this issue after we designed it that we couldn't figure out how to evaluate it. So after like a year of work on this, we finally wrote a paper on how do you evaluate dimension reduction algorithms. So this is the paper, it's called a comprehensive evaluation of dimension reduction methods. And we did it for transcriptomic data. Now, um, I'll just tell you what the evaluation methods were. I'm not gonna go through them all in detail or anything like that. You can read the paper if you wanna see that. But basically for evaluating local structure, we suggest taking a supervised data set, throwing away the labels temporarily, projecting the data down, so you, you just do dimension reduction on X and not Y, then you put the labels back, and then you run machine learning to see if you can classify the data in two dimensions. And so that will tell you whether the clusters are sort of separated properly. Um, for global structure, we suggest checking a triplet loss where you look at IJK triples, and then just seeing if, you know, if J is closer to I in the high dimensional space, it should also be closer in the low dimensional space. And then we have sensitivity to parameter choices. Like if you change the parameters, you shouldn't do what TSNE does that I showed you at the beginning. Sensitivity to preprocessing choices, that it shouldn't be sensitive to preprocessing choices. And then of course, computational efficiency. So um, PacMap does well in all these metrics, but I don't really like showing tables and talks. So I'm just gonna do a couple of, um, just show you kind of what's going on. So I'll show you first sensitivity to parameter choices. So here's an example where we knew which cell types should go together. And we ran TSNE with different perplexity values. And here the cell type, this one, these are supposed to be together and they're not. And then we adjust the perplexity and all of a sudden they're together. <laughs> Okay, and then um, here is UMAP, and again, they're separate, then they're together, then they're together, then they're separate, you know. So just these algorithms don't maintain global structure. And then TriMap, um, of course, beautifully maintains global structure, um, although I'm not sure I agree with what it did here. And then this is PacMap's result, it's always like that. So that, that's to get an ex exactly right. And then for preprocessing, what often people do is they take high dimensional data, and they use the first 100 principal components and then do DR, like, because you can't run a DR method on a huge number of, of dimensions. So you reduce down to 100 using PCA. Then you do from PCA, use the DR method to go down to two dimensions. And so the number of dimensions you go down, you know, I chose 100 dimensions, but I could have chosen 25 or 50 or whatever, and it shouldn't matter. And unfortunately, it does, right? With, with TSNE, if you use 30 principal components, it's together, 50, it's apart, 70, it's together. So, and then you map, um, it's together at 30, apart at 50, apart at 70, and apart at 100. Uh, okay, that's not supposed to be what happens. TriMap is, again, completely consistent because it cares about global structure, and PathMap is completely consistent because it cares about global structure. And then for runtime, um, I, this is the only table I have in the, in the whole talk. And you can see that um, this, this table is really easy to read because PacMap is just way faster than everything else because it's just much simpler. Its loss function is just way simpler than anything else. So it just runs faster and it scales better. 
All right, so I think what I'm going to do is just end the talk with a whole bunch of demos. I'm just going to show you what we've been doing with DR. So I already showed you, um, and I just want you to keep in mind um, that, like I said, um, there, there are certain data sets where you want to preserve global structure primarily and certain data sets where you want to preserve local structure. So MNIST is one of these local structure data sets. And so here you're seeing great results from UMAP and, um, and, and maybe TSE. I don't know, it's still separated out this, you know, cluster that I don't like, but, um, you're not seeing great results from TriMap here and PacMap does as well as UMAP, which is, you know, the best one for local structure. And then for data sets like the Mammoth, where we care about global structure, PacMap performs as well as the best global structure algorithm, which is TriMap, okay? And the rest of them don't handle global structure very well. So here's a bunch of more data sets. This is the COIL 20 data sets. Here's an example where ts &E opened up all the COILs, which is quite unfortunate. Um, this is COIL 100. Uh, actually, I think I think TS and E did a nice job here, believe it or not. Um, here, all the coils are separated nicely. So this this is actually very nice over there. Um, this is the MNIST data set again. This is fashion MNIST, which instead of handwritten digits, it's like sandals and purses and shirts and stuff like that. And so here um, you can see that PacMap and UMAP performed very, very similarly on this data set and the other ones um, not so much. So these two very similar. Okay, here is the post office data set, another handwritten digit data set. 20 news groups, nobody did particularly well on this data set. And I think it's because you just can't separate out the news groups. I think the news groups are highly overlapping. This is S curve of the whole, which got mangled by TS and EU map and large biz. And here are the global structure methods get it right every time. Now, this one is the one I'm worried about. So when you look at, you know, these kind of like RNA-seq data sets, if you use a method like ts &E or UMAP, you end up seeing a lot of local clusters that frankly shouldn't, shouldn't be there. They're just an artifact of the DR method. And what I get worried about is that biologists actually will look at these plots and go, oh, it's a cluster. I need to go investigate that. I need to figure out why that cluster is there. Is that something biological? And the answer is it's not biological. It's just an artifact of the DR method. These methods don't have that problem. Um, here is a beautiful picture created by um, one of my, uh, um, so Carla who's visiting my lab. This is, um, PB, this is a blood data set colored three different ways by PacMap. This is the same data set on UMAP. And then um, you can see PacMap did a much better job here on this data set. And then this um, data set, this, this problem was really helpful. This is a name ethnicity classification, which is helpful for assessing fairness because you're trying to guess people's ethnicity from their name. So you could kind of determine whether, even if you don't have race information, you can determine whether or not the, you know, the loan decisions are being, are fair to different ethnic groups. And here we've projected the space of names down to two dimensions. And you can see here, like these are white names, these are black names, these are Asian names, and these are Hispanic names. And this is based on voter registration data. And so it's, it's kind of pretty cool to see the space of names like this and the overlap of the black names with the white names. And it's partly because the, um, the, slaves, um, the slaves took the names of their, of their owners. And so you get a lot of this kind of overlap in names. And then the last one I'll present is on EEG monitoring. Oh, it's not the last one, it's the second last one. Um, I'll present on EEG monitoring. Um, so I've been um, working with a critical care neurologist for many years, and they have different kinds of brain signals that they're reading off of EEG monitors, and they've um, put them, they, they, we've been designing an interpretable neural network, and this is showing the latent space of the interpretable neural network with respect to all the different classes of seizure-like activity. And so the doctors have been having a lot of fun um, making little movies that go between like, this is one kind of seizure-like activity, and then this is another kind, and this is another kind. And you can walk kind of between these legs of this like sea creature to see the different types of EEG activity. Um, so it's like an educational tool for neurologists. And then finally, um, 
the data set from the Explainable Machine Learning Challenge, which is a loan decision data set, um, my students named the pack map method. Um, you know, they they named it, uh, you know, it's like, it's got an actual name, like principal ap approximate manifold, something, you know, something like that. And I thought, you know, when they named pac map, I thought, okay, you know, it's, it's kind of a silly name. It sounds like Pac-Man, which is a cartoon character. Like, I don't know if I like it, but the students named it. So let's just go with the flow there. So then I emailed um, Ying Fan a while back and I said to her, could, could you just, you know, do a pac map plot for the FICO data set? You know, just, just, just do a plot for this data set. And she said, okay. And she sent me this picture back that I couldn't believe. I couldn't believe it. So she sent me this picture and I was like, really? Like that? Really? Like Pac Map is making Pac Man on this data set? <laughs> really? <laughs> like, I swear it's never done this before. It's just so bizarre. Um, and there is a technical explanation for it. Like, you know, it's, this little chunk has missing data and this chunk it has a high value of this important feature and this, you know, these other, you know, we could, just, we could explain it, but there's just, you know, it's mimicking what we see in our supervised models. But I find, you know, I find this, this kind of um, explanatory data analysis useful because it tells you something about like the cluster structures in the data, but it's really hard to take this result seriously. <laughs> Anyway, just to summarize, um, I talked to you about what makes the DR algorithm succeed or fail, which is local structure. Got to have a good loss function. Got to have a good rainbow plot that obeys the principles. Uh, the rainbow plot allows you to compare across algorithms. It should look like that. For global structure, we suggest forces on non-neighbors, and particularly mid-near pairs, which fixes global structure. We presented a method called PACMAP. It's a simpler loss function involving only three terms, um, an attractive force for friends, a repulsive force for enemies, and a gentle attractive force for the mid-near pairs. It's very, very simple. It preserves local and global structure, and it runs very quickly. It scales, to, scales better than other methods. And um, yeah, so it, it hopefully it'll give you some information you can glean about what's actually in your data set so you can be a responsible decision maker. All right. Thanks very much. Okay, that, that was a great talk. Uh, any, any questions from the audience? Okay. okay, there there is a question. You can unmute yourself and just uh, mention the question. Yeah, I can see the question. It's okay. So the question is okay. about dimension reduction of bird embeddings from seven sixty eight to two. Yeah, you can. Um, you might want you might want to project uh, using PCA to the first one hundred principal components and then do DR from one hundred to two. Um, so the EEG example that I gave a few a few seconds ago is actually from the embeddings of a um, interpretable neural network for EEG signals. So it's definitely possible to um, do embeddings of, you know, any kind of neural network. Um, it's, it's, you know, totally, totally fine, totally possible. Lots of people have done it. Yeah. But, but won't that like uh, degrade the results uh, compared to using a 768 dimension if we use two? Uh, wouldn't would, would it not lead to loss of information? Of course. I mean, every time you project from seven sixty eight dimensions to two dimensions, you're going to lose information. Mm -hmm. Right. That's that's quite drastic, actually. Yeah, but you're not. You know, here mm -hmm. they're, you're just visualizing it to figure out what part of the. You know, to just look at the high dimensional space. You you mm -hmm. probably don't want to have the DR method inside the neural network. You're just looking at the latent space to figure out what's what's going on with it. All right. Okay. So, so, so we can use that like for explainable explainability purpose. Is, yeah. is that how we would put it? Okay. okay. Yeah. I mean, you can, if you want to actually force the latent space to be more interpretable, you can use an interpretable neural network technique. Like you could use, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you want the latent space to be kind of clustery, or if you want to separate out concepts along the axes of the latent space, you can use something like concept whitening 
Or if you want to do um, like kind of clustering or, or case-based reasoning in latent space, you could use ProtoPNet or something like that. So that's where you're actually constraining the neural network. But here, I think the question was simply, can we visualize what's going on inside the latent space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if it'll good, good, give good results. I think, you know, it, it, I don't know. I'm not really sure. It depends, I guess, what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. I don't know what, what's considered good here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. That, that maybe that will depend on the task what it is. Yeah, I mean, also, you know, sometimes the, the latent space of neural networks, like when you're projecting down, it's sort of designed to make the class is kind of, you know, it's kind of designed to be almost gas, like keep the data set almost Gaussian. So, so it's not clear whether, um, whether you'll get kind of something really amazing um, after you um, are, you know, after you embed the signals. Right. And, and how would you put this into, uh, as far as I remember, like there's a, a method in recommendation system as well, where the rating matrix is uh, size of the rating matrix is reduced using this SVD technique wherein the uh, that that's also a dimensionality problem if we look at it in that way. Well, that's PCA so, essentially, right? So, right, right. Yeah, so you're getting global structure out of that, but you're not getting you're not maintain you're not maintaining local structure when you when you do that. Mm -hmm. And and I think that literature does not like cover that much or like it has moved beyond it. I wouldn't say move beyond it, or it is underexplored, maybe. Uh, applying well, TSA or something. Should, sorry, what is underexplored? Uh, using TSA techniques in a recommendation system. So I would think that people would do that, right? Because you want to make sure your recommendation system, like you want to know who your clusters are in recommender systems, I would assume, because you have different types of, you know, if you're if I'm designing a recommender system, I want to know who my clusters of clients are, like my my customers are. So I would be definitely doing some kind of dimension reduction to view what the clusters are. Like I would want to know if the clusters are, you know, are, are they, how many clusters are there? Are there distinct clusters? Is there a manifold that I should know about? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I would, I would really want to know what's in my data so that I can design a recommender system that works for the different types of customers. Right, right. And and maybe we don't get a Pac-Man shape <laughs> uh, cluster as yeah. you shown in the earlier. <laughs> well, you might. I don't know. I mean, that was a loan okay. decision. That. So like, mm -hmm. you know, maybe if, you're, okay. maybe if you're recommending loan products, you would get that. I don't know. <laughs> right. Or maybe some Tetris shaped uh, objects, maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, any Any other questions from the audience? Well, I, I think not, it seems. All right, okay, I, I think uh, that's that's all for now. Okay. All right, okay. Uh, thank thank you. you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, making time for uh, your busy schedule for us and being part of FIRE. Uh, we really appreciate it. All right, bye. Yeah, bye, thank you. Okay, so that, that brings an end to FIRE 2022 and hopefully we'll meet next year in FIRE 2023. Thank you very much for being part of it. Thank you, Shurubindu. Thank you. Thank you.